Proverbs. Okay, last week we began our study of Proverbs, introducing it, uh, just to review a little bit. Solomon wrote how many Proverbs? Or compiled how many? 3,000. Uh, so Proverbs, a lot of them were his, some of them were from other uh, wise people that he incorporated. What was the purpose of putting down the Proverbs? Guidance. Guidance. For who? The people who are reading it. Uh, yes, more specifically, his son. His, or his sons. And most people now interpret that as all the sons. Because all the Jews used it to uh, educate their sons and their family, their kids. So, uh, in the study last week, we talked about that wisdom comes from God, and it comes through a. Can you let them in back there? It comes through a uh, relationship with God. I mean, if you don't have a relationship, you're not going to be able to really attain wisdom. Uh, you have to have a relationship, a close relationship, so that you begin to understand God, you know God, you know what he's talking about, what he's trying to show you, and through that comes the wisdom of what he is showing you. And so uh, Solomon repeats that several times throughout Proverbs, uh, saying, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Back, the relationship, the closeness of your relationship with the God is the beginning of knowledge. But fools do what? Reject it. Reject it. Reject it. Yeah, he says, <clears throat> fools despise wisdom and discipline. And we're going to talk about discipline. Uh, fools despise wisdom. And we talk about that all throughout Proverbs that you contrast God's wisdom with fools who reject that wisdom and the situations of each and what happens to the foolish. Um, he also told him to seek wisdom like it was a gift from God. And remember the verses where it said, when you seek this wisdom, you Again, it's sort of attain, attaining this wisdom is like a, a, a very valuable chain put over your neck and around your neck. Uh, or it's like a crown uh, that's put on your head. It's a treasure. It's uh, something that, uh, in actuality, it, uh, it separates you from the fools. And it shows others through your actions and everything else, because you know, we don't get a gold chain, or we don't get a wreath on our head, or whatever else, but through our actions, our speech, our words, whatever we do, it is like this uh, recognition that, oh, you're, you're different. You're not like all these foolish people over here. Uh, if I have a question and I want a good answer, I'm gonna ask you. Uh, I'm not going to go to all these foolish people over here that might say, well, I feel like this is the way it should be. Or I've heard, or a bunch of us got together and we think this is the way it ought to be. Uh, you know, God does not do surveys and come up with the best answer regarding the survey. What was that old uh, TV show game? where the answer is, and, you know, they ask a question and they would have four or five different answers and uh, the ones with the most votes was the number one answer all the way down. And people would try to Family guess. Feud? They, what? Family Feud? Family Feud. Family Feud. Uh, God doesn't do it that way. <laughs> you know, fools do it that way. They go out and survey this, survey that, poll this, poll that, and see what, see what uh, sounds the best. Or, uh, what tickles the people's ears the most? 
we don't study Proverbs 2. It's, our lesson skips 2 and goes straight into 3. But there was a couple of verses in 2 that I thought we ought to just you know, go ahead and, and look at. Uh, someone read Proverbs 2, 6 through 8. For the Lord gives wisdom from his heart, from knowledge and understanding. He stores a sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the path of justice and watching over the way of the saints. Okay. For the Lord gives wisdom, again, saying wisdom comes from God, from that relationship, and knowledge and understands, and he holds victory in store for the upright. Uh, when, we, when we think of victorious, what do we think of? Winning. Winning. Overcoming somebody or something. I think... Uh, I'm not sure the meaning of the, that that's the meaning of the word victorious here. I think it's more of you have a victorious life, not that you've slayed all your enemies or climbed all the mountains or anything like that, but you live a moral life. Remember, you know, God looks at things differently than we do. We look at it with earthly eyes, sometimes with a spiritual bent to it. But uh, God looks at things spiritually. And, and what is he trying to do for us? Uh, he's trying to help us to have a victorious life, but it's building that relationship, isn't it? You know, he's building that relationship that he's going to have with us for eternity. So I think his meaning of a victorious life is probably different than ours. We would think that, oh, if we die wealthy with all our grandkids around us or whatever else, well, we've had a victorious life. No, that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about, well, what have you done? Because what will we be measured against? What we have done uh, for God on this earth. Not what we've accumulated <laughs> or anything like that. It's for what we've done. That's victory uh, to him. Proverbs uh, 2, 12 through 15. His word leads from the way of the evil man, from the land that speaks froward things. He leads the path of uprightness to walk in the way of the darkness. Who rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the wicked? Whose ways are crooked, and they throw within their paths. Yes. Wisdom will save you. From who? Fools. Yeah, the wicked people, the fools. And it will save you several ways. It will save you from the wicked men. The, their perverse words that are trying to sway you. We talked a little bit about that or they're trying to encourage you to do wrong, or maybe they're just slandering you. Who knows? Uh, ones that have, they, they walk in dark ways. In other words, uh, they don't walk in the light. We're supposed, as Christians, to walk in the light. These prefer to walk in the dark. And their paths are what? Crooked. It's not straight, you know. And primarily because why? They're weaving lines. And if you're weaving lines, you know, you move, well, we go this way for a while, and oh that I, so I'll tell you another lie, we go this way, you know. They they weave crooked paths to, first of all, distract you, keep you off your way, and eventually what happens? They get lost. And you can't figure out which way to go. So wisdom keeps that from happening, keeping you away from devious people. Okay, Proverbs 3, 1 through 2. We'll get into the lesson here. My son, don't forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commands, for they will bring you many days a full life and well-being. Okay. 
my son, do forget not forget my teaching and reminding him. But keep my commands where? In your heart. In your heart. Interesting word, interesting Hebrew word here, a heart. You know, we would probably say, keep keep my words in your brain. <laughs> you know, but the, I don't think the Hebrews had a concept of brain. That would be, you know, the mental part. Everything was associated for them with the heart. And uh, for them, if you look at the, the etymology of this word it, uh, for heart, it, it really is saying it's the inner man. It's the, uh, it, it, it combines the mind, the will, the moral character, the emotions, the determination. I mean, the soul, everything that you are is in your heart. So he's saying here, keep the commands in your heart, in your innermost being of who you are, the real you, the, the you know, not the one you might project, but the one that is you, without any uh, fanfare or anything else. This is who you are, the inner person here. In fact, the Hebrew symbol, and I can draw very well. Something like that. And of course, Hebrew, you read at the left. Uh, it's it's a picture because Hebrew words were you know, pictures sort of like Chinese. Chinese, if you take apart, they've been stylized and everything else, but they originally were sort of pictures that conveyed a meaning. This picture here is a combination of a shepherd's staff and the outline of a tent, the inside of a tent. A nomadic tent where most of them live. And so what it's saying here, or what it's trying to convey through this picture, is a, a shepherd's staff which represented authority. And because what did the shepherd do with his staff? He worried off the animals. Yeah, he worried off the animals or he moved the sheep with it. You know, if you're reluctant, you get a little staff. And uh, so uh, you know, the staff represented authority, and the other symbol, which represents the floor plan of their nomadic tent, uh, sort of represented that the family resides in the tent. So the concept that they were combining here uh, is the authority within. So what he's saying here is that when it's in your heart, that is the authority within you. That's who you are. I mean, it's a very, when you really look at it, it's a very heavy word. It's saying, we, we tend to say, oh, it's in your heart. And we draw little cute parts and everything else. But when God is saying, or saying, put it in your heart, he means in your innermost being with authority. Don't just put it in there as letting it dangle around or anything like that. Absorb it. It's the authority within. You're making it part of you, of who you are. So when he says, keep my commands in your heart, he is saying, make them a part of you. Where eventually there's no difference between you and these sayings or these commands or who I am. And you go to the New Testament and you sort of think of, I was thinking of that and, and what is Christianity trying to do? What does it do for us? It saves us, yes, but what is it also trying to do? Put Christ in our heart. It teaches us how to walk our it changes our hearts because it helps us to walk in faith. And really, when you get down to it, there are verses, uh, I didn't write them all down, but there are verses that, uh, why were they called Christians? Because they're little Christ. 
Isn't that the purpose, purpose of Christianity? Is to make all of us in Christ's uh, image. Uh, and so this is what he's saying here. I think if you really get into the heart of it, is that, you know, put these in your heart, not just to sort of be there and put them on a shelf or anything like that, take them down occasionally, but make them into who you are. You become Christ-like. You become, as a Christian, Christ-like. You become a person who people look at you and say, there is a wise man. It becomes part of your countenance because it permeates you so much. Uh, so I think this is what he is trying to get here. Uh, keep your commands in uh, your heart. And he also says something here. It says in verse 2, For they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. Uh, really? Really? What's he say? What well, my way says the length of days, years of life, and peace. And peace. Okay. We'll add to you. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not saying. He, I, I don't think Solomon here said, "Oh, you're going to live to be a ripe old age." What I think he. What do you think he's meaning here by a long life? I mean, it's pretty simple. He says, "For a long life, many years." Yeah, they will prolong your life many years. And I think he's saying is that, hey, you, you may not die of an old age, but those years are going to be good years. Uh, you're going to have a fulfilled life, a meaningful life, a life that blesses others. And like you said, that sense of peace, even when bad things happen. Even in a crisis, you'll have that sense of peace. Yes? Jerry, would that sense of peace be also what uh, Christ prayed for us when he ascended into heaven for unity? Sure. For, for unity and protection against the evil one. And, yes. Uh, Godliness. Yeah. Why did we call Jesus the Prince of Peace? Peace. Yeah. He wanted peace. He knew. There are going to be persecutions. He talked about it. If you follow me, you're going to be persecuted. But I want to bring you peace. You almost think, mm, what, what have we got here? Sort of two opposing things. Uh, but what he's saying is there is a peace that if you have it in your heart, you'll be able to you know, make it through all of these things. Uh, you'll have, you know, it won't destroy you, not physically, but spiritually. Again, you know, God is looking at the spiritual nature. He knows we're physical beings, and we have a certain amount of time on this earth. Sometimes it's shorter, sometimes it's longer. But he is looking at the heart, the inner being, and molding that. Because he's got a use for us in eternity. And... Uh, Proverbs 3, 3 through 4. Let the love of faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God. Amen. Okay. Now, some versions have different one. Mine is NIV, and it says love and faithfulness. Uh, did you read loyalty and faithfulness? Or what did you? Yeah. Love and faithfulness? I know our, our book has love and faithfulness. I mean, uh, uh, loyalty and faithfulness. Any other versions out there different? I think some have kindness, some have truth. Uh, these Mercy. kind of characteristics. Mercy and truth. Mercy and truth, yeah. Uh, you know, those great qualities. Uh, but how do you wear them around your neck? So it's never leave you. Bind them around your neck. 
and write them on a tablet. That's your heart. That would you find it around your neck? I used to hate wearing ties. <laughs> I still hate wearing ties. And fortunately, we don't wear ties very much anymore. <laughs> I had a whole closet full of them. And, uh, you know, uh, because they were sort of stifling. Kind of correct right up against your throat. But he's saying, find them, tighten them uh, around your neck. Let me ask you, let's, let's look at it this way. Why do you wear a Christian cross if you wear a Christian cross? I wore one because it protects, I hope it, I hope it helps uh, connect me to God and also to my mother. Okay. Why else? Some people wear it just because it's an ornament. It doesn't mean anything. It's just, hey, everybody else is wearing it. I'm going to get me a big one and wear it. So, but why do Christians wear crosses? That's where our salvation comes. It's a reminder to us. And it also shows others that we're Christians. If you really wear it for the correct reason, it is sort of like saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of being a Christian. And, oh, by the way, I should be, it's a reminder of us, every time we put it on or we look at it, I'm supposed to be acting like one, Christ-like. And with loyalty, with kindness, with love, you know, all those other things. This, it's sort of a two-way street. First of all, it shows people around us, you're a Christian, therefore, hopefully they think of you as having certain values that either they have or don't have, uh, but it reminds you of those values and that relationship and how you should act and talk. Well, it's the same thing with the Star of David. A lot of, a lot of people sure. are the Star of David. Yeah, yes. Uh, you know, they, they aren't ashamed of being Jewish. And so they, they want people to know. Some people react positively, some people react negatively. Uh, but they're proud of their heritage and what it means. And it says, I'm one of God's chosen people. Now, what could be better than that? Hopefully you'll have a relationship to back it up. Uh, and God doesn't say, uh, but, you know, what he's saying here is that in a way you wear it and people will see it and you will feel it and you will know it. Uh, then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Uh, so will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Yes? I'm just thinking about that. When I passed by at a neighbor's house down the street, I saw a cross propped over, over on his side of the yard. I, and I hadn't met the guy yet. I've seen him. But, you know, I thought, you know, I can talk to him and, sure. you know, see where he's going to church or, or whatever. But sure. Immediately a, a little light went off. Uh -huh. That one, that's somebody that perhaps I can relate to and actually have a conversation with without being attacked or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think as part of that it is that you will find favor and a good name because you look upon that person with the cross in the yard differently. And hopefully, you know, their actions and words will uh, be there and encourage you. Uh, the first Christians used a fish symbol, right? Mm -hmm. Fish symbol, yes. Yep. Uh, a lot of times you see it on the back of a car or something like that. You know, a cross or a fish symbol or something that sort of says, uh, I'm going to drive like a Christian. <laughs> That's why I never put one on mine. <laughs> because sometimes I probably don't drive like a Christian. <laughs> he said that Jeff Foxworthy had a great joke about that. 
he said. He saw a bumper sticker on a car went down and said, Honk if you love Jesus. So he honked at the guy and the driver flipped him off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Be careful what you put on your car. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Where are we? Uh, Uh, in verse 4, one thing I thought about as I was looking at this verse is, you know, uh, when I was a minister, uh, I had a guy who came in, and we were located near a military base, so we had a number of military in our uh, congregation, and I had a guy, he was recruiting for a company, and he came in, and he said, yeah, I haven't talked to him for a little while, he says, you know, I can't go out and publicize this, but... I like to hire Christians, and I like to hire Christian vets. And I said, oh, okay, well, why? Well, because they work hard, they're loyal, they're honest, and they know how to get things done. And he said, I can't go out and put an advertisement up but you who know your congregation and guys who may be getting out of the military or whatever else, you, you know, feed me some names. So I did. Now, I don't know if they ever connected or went to work for them or anything else, but I often thought about that. I mean, there's companies today that say, we want to hire military vets. Why? They're disciplined. They know how to get things done. And, and they're used to uh, obeying commands. <laughs> you know, they don't ask questions. They just go out and get it done. So, you know, uh, I think he said that people will look on you and, your, and have favor towards you because they know you're a person of your word. They know perhaps you work hard. They know that you'll always be loyal, that you'll be faithful, trustworthy, you know, all those things. And God looks on that too. Because you're providing a blessing to him, a good example. A, hey, you're putting that in your heart and demonstrating it to the world. Okay, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Familiar verse. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will direct your paths. Okay. Trust in the Lord, Lord with all your heart. Has anybody heard that a number of, or a number of times? Mm -hmm. Yes. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Always acknowledge him all your ways, and he will make your path straight. Uh, look at, you know, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. This is not a 50-50 type of thing. Yeah, you say it here, is it? He's not saying trust in the Lord sometimes. It's not a 75-25. It's 100%, right? And that's what he's saying here. Trust in the Lord 100%. Not some other percentage. Uh, not part way, but in all. Uh, Someone read Proverbs 28 26. Whoever robs his father or his mother. 2826. 2826. 2826. Uh, whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. No, not right. Yeah, that's it. Um, whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. Well, he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Yes. You know, we're fools when we trust in our own <laughs> mind. Uh, and I think that's what he's saying uh, here. He says, and, and also, in all your ways, know him. And we've talked about this before. How do you know God? 
You talk to him. You trust him. You speak to him. You acknowledge him. You listen. We talked about listening and hearing last week. <laughs> Forgot to review that. Uh, yeah, my wife gave me a look when we, she was listening to the YouTube thing. Okay, yeah, you're right. Uh, when we hear and not listen, we talked about listening, that honesty, that trust, that relationship that we have uh, in all your ways, in all in things. Uh, it reminded me that a number of years ago, uh, I was at a conference, it was a conference on prayer. Uh, and one of the, the speakers there, uh, you know, was uh, a director. Uh, he, at that time, was uh, in charge of all the uh, kitchens and mobile kitchens and mobile feeding that the Baptist had. Uh, you know, when you see the Red Cross and you say they're feeding thousands and everything else, a lot of times that's not the Red, that's maybe the Red Cross over it, but it's the Baptist men who are, have brought, Baptist men and women who have brought in all these kitchens and everything else and all the food and everything and all the volunteers to feed thousands after a hurricane. We, we've had them in Texas, down in Galveston. Uh, we have Huntsville, and, uh, we had a hurricane up there. Uh, you know, but the Red Cross has admitted that they could not do everything they could without this organization of hundreds and hundreds of people and mobile kitchens stationed all over the place that they can bring in and set up and stay for months at a time. And so he was the director of all of this. He was a very busy guy. And he said, he said, you know, he was reading the Bible and doing his devotion one day, and he was reading something like this. I don't know which verses he was talking about, but he said, let the Lord direct your paths, essentially. Trust in the Lord, not your own understanding. And he was a busy guy, you know. He had walked in the office on Monday morning, and he had already had calls and people to respond to and everything else. And he made the decision that I'm not going to do any of that. I'm going to walk in the office Monday morning, and I'm going to wait all day. <laughs> Pretty serious thing. And so he did. He said, I, I drove into work and they were in the office building and everything, everything. I took the elevator up and he said, It was amazing when I got out of the elevator, somebody was waiting for me and started talking to me about something we both needed to do. And as we walked to the office, we saw this problem. And throughout the day, people came in not to waste his time or give him more tasks to do, but they came in, real problems, real problems that they saw. And that's the way it was. He said, I didn't arrange for any meetings. I didn't do any of these kind of things that most supervisors or directors do. I just let people come in, people phone me, and it was the right people. And he said it was amazing. When there was a problem that needed to be solved, all of a sudden there was a phone call or a message or a person showed up and we solved the problem. And I thought, man, to have the courage to live that kind of life, you know, most people come into the office doing what? Um, think about all the problems I got to solve today, all the decisions I got to make, all the people I need to talk to, all this. And they look at the 100 emails, and I've got to respond, uh, you know. And so what do we do? We just get caught up into the stuff, into the busyness of life, and we don't listen. We don't hear. And this guy made a conscious decision. <laughs> I'm going to move all that out of the way and just listen. He said, I thought I might be sitting in my office all day, not doing anything. But he 
God's busyness is a lot better than man's busyness. Is more productive. So I thought of that when uh, I was reading these verses. Uh, Proverbs 3, 7, and 8. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord <clears throat> turn away from evil. This will be healing for your body and strengthening for your body. Okay. Wow. He just keeps coming up with pithy, pithy sayings, doesn't he? Uh, do not be wise in your own eyes. What does that mean? It means don't lean on yourself to make a, a determination. Don't be... Don't lean on yourself to make a determination. Okay. Yeah. In other words, oh, I'm smart. I've been to college. I've got an advanced degree. So, yeah, I know this. Uh, usually, I think there is a word that sort of describes this, and it's throughout the Bible. <laughs> it's pride. What do we say? Pride comes before fall. <laughs> You know, the worst thing that can probably happen to you is to be successful, isn't it? Because success tends to bring a reward, but sometimes it brings other things too. Because when you've tasted success, you want to continue to be successful. <clears throat> when you're successful, it brings a certain pride. You want to think, oh. Pretty smart guy. Yeah. And that old eye starts cropping up. And so uh, this pride is part, I think, of this being wise in our own eyes. We think, oh, I've done this before and it came out well. I can do it again. I can figure this out. You know? Taking that stuff that's in your heart and say, mm, I don't need you right now. I got this. I got this guy. <laughs> I mean, downfalls are probably come from that. Oh, God, I got this. Yeah. Don't worry. You go, you know, help somebody else. I can do this. Yeah. Success among pastors is, is usually a dangerous thing in some respects. Uh, okay. And then it says something else in verse 9. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Fearing the Lord and shunning evil will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. What is he saying here? This is an explanatory name. Yeah. Uh, what happens when you don't have to worry about something? You're healed. You feel better, don't you? You know, successful people trying to be successful all the time is it, <clears throat> people get ulcers, don't they? Stress. Stress. What brings on heart attacks? Yeah, stress. Your dad and fall apart. Your family and fall apart. Yeah, things start falling apart around you, and what does that do? That just adds more stress. You don't eat well. What happens to your bones? <laughs> You do your body, it begins to deteriorate. But God's saying, fear the Lord, internalize these commands that I'm talking to you about. You know, learn wisdom from the Lord, and you won't have all this stress. And in a lot of ways, you'll be healthier because you'll eat right. You won't be driving through McDonald's grabbing something that's not healthy for you. Just because, oh, I've got to get to work and I've got to get this done. Or I've got to solve this problem. I don't have time to eat. Uh, you know, stress. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Proverbs 3, 9 through 10. Let me speed it up. Honor the Lord with your wealth. With your first fruits of all your crops, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Okay, so what's he saying here? If 
Okay. Uh, he's talking about tithing with the first fruits, uh, offering with the first fruits, and the first fruits were the best. Mm -hmm. uh, really, the first fruits aren't the first strawberries more expensive than the last strawberries. <laughs> That's how people think. You know, the first fruits are more expensive because A, they're first, and B, you know, they're right at the peak. You know, they're right there. And then I think too, <coughs> what are you saying that if you do what he asks, healing your flesh, your, your flesh and refreshing of your bones, this is your reward for not being not being surprised. Sure. Uh, look at uh, Leviticus 25-23. I want to read that. Leviticus 25-23. The land shall not be sold to residents. For the land is mine. For ye are strangers and sojourners with me. Yes. What's God speaking here, and he is saying what? <clears throat> the land is mine. You know, the land doesn't really belong to you. He was instructing the Israelites about the use of land and everything else, you know, rotating uh, every seven years and, and all that, uh, those different things. Uh, and he was really speaking about the Jubilee year, when everything was supposed to return back to him. <laughs> or back to the original owner. Uh, but he was saying, the land doesn't belong to you. You, in, its, in effect, are aliens on my land. Uh, so what is he, how does this relate to bringing your possessions or your first fruits to God? He is the Yeah, it belongs to me already. You're just giving back to me when I've wronged you. Uh, Exodus 23, 19. And, you, and as you harvest each of your crops, bring me a choice sample of the first day's harvest. It must be offered to the Lord your God. Okay. So he had already made this command. And really, uh, Solomon here is just reminding the reader that honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Uh, honor the Lord with offerings. Now, in a agrarian society, like the Israelites were, and, and sheep and uh, shepherds and that sort of thing, you know, they understood that. Now, in the 21st century, how do we understand that? Money. Well, well, yeah. There are a lot of people that don't have to, so we can give to the food bank. Sure. Or to our churches. Yeah. Those baby bottles. Yeah, baby bottles, uh, offerings to the church or whatever else, or to a missionary. Or, you know, we support a lot of ministries here. I think uh, last week, that uh, Jack was uh, showing some slides of the ministry, God's Garage, giving cars uh, to uh, women who have families and, and don't have transportation and that sort of thing. Uh, a lot of ministries in this area, local, statewide, national, a lot of ways that you can honor God through your possessions. Uh, even stuff you don't uh, need anymore. You can give to a number of different missions around here. Uh, there's some missions that we support, uh, I can't remember the name of it, where uh, the guys out of prison, uh, you know, they, they try to reintegrate them into society. Uh, uh, pregnancy care center, uh, like with the, the bottles, and, but they need other things too. There's lots of ways that we can take our possessions and uh, bring them to the Lord and honor them Honor the Lord. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth. So that means us 
Because if you look, in fact, there is a website. I meant to look that website up. There's a website where you can put in how much you're worth, and it shows where you stand in relationship with the rest of the world. And I'm not a rich guy by any means, but you know, I put in what I estimated. And I was wealthier than 99.999%, I guess, of the rest of the world. You know, Americans really don't understand poverty in a lot of ways. Uh, but there are some poor places on this planet, and our wealth. Once you get out of the U.S. and into other countries, you'll really see the difference in the term wealth uh, with regard to us. Uh, and what does what Jesus say? Too much of it that has been given, much will be required. Okay, and also what he's talking about here is the offering. Yeah, honor the, guard, uh, honor the Lord with your wealth. Honor God with your wealth. We need, it's not just a, a taking a billfold out, putting some money in the play, or writing a check to a ministry, or uh, anything else. What he's talking about here is giving God or back to God is an act of worship. Just as we go in on Sunday morning, we sing songs or whatever else. You know, that worship is directed at God, isn't it? It's not directed this way. It's between you and God. And that's what he's saying here, is that your offering is an act of worship. Too many times we just think, oh, you know, <clears throat> we write the check and we don't think about it. We don't pray over it. We don't say it. God use this to really go to the right place and do the right thing. Or, you know, and and sometimes we use these calculators to calculate it out to the penny. <laughs> so, you know, uh, but it should be an act of worship, something you can't wait to do. And you're proud of and you want to do that. Because it underscores your gratitude for his provision because he's already it already belongs to him doesn't it? we're just giving it back because he allowed us to use it and to make enough to live on and more so that we can give that more of the extra back so it underscores our gratitude our thankfulness that we can do this that we are able to provide this to others. It reflects your faith in God. Because what does it say? I have the faith that you're going to continue to provide for me. I'm honoring you. I'm worshiping you. And I have gratitude. And I have the faith that you're going to continue to provide. Maybe you won't be the same amount or different or whatever else. But God, you're the provider. I'm the alien. I'm the one that really doesn't own the squat. I might think I do, <laughs> but I don't. God owns it all. And lastly, it confirms your confidence that uh, your confidence rests in Him and not your possessions. Because too many times, what? Man, we want to hold on to stuff, don't we? Uh, and it confirms that you realize that everything belongs to Him and that without Him, you wouldn't have anything. But if you didn't have anything and only had Him, you'd have everything. I used to do a little exercise, and I would, before class, I would tell people, I want you to write down the three most precious possessions that you have, or own, or whatever. The things that are most precious to you, the top three things. 
And then I would start the lesson, a similar lesson like this. And if I had thought of it earlier, I would have done it to you guys. And somewhere partway through the lesson, I would say, okay, the item that you listed, number three, we had a terrible tornado, hurricane, and it took it, it destroyed it. So scratch it off. And a little while later, as we continued on, I would say, there's been a terrible accident, a terrible tragedy, uh, a terrible catastrophe, and the thing, second thing that you have on that list has been destroyed, it's gone. You no longer have it. And then, at the end of the lesson, I would say, if the number one thing on your list is not God and your faith and your salvation, then you've lost everything. Because really, in the end, isn't that all that we have, all that we deserve, all that we can expect, you know, it's very tempting to list, to list your house or, you know, a favorite car or whatever else, or your estate or as a number three, or maybe family as number two or even number one. But if you don't have God in there, it all means nothing. They can all disappear like that and will. <laughs> and it's only through Christ that we have anything, that we have hope. That is our greatest possession. And that's why when he says this, uh, I'm the Lord with your wealth should be a no-brainer. Unfortunately, it is. Uh, verse 10, is speed up. Verse 10, Proverbs 3, verse 10. We read it. Oh, oh, and we read that. Okay. Uh, yeah. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Uh, do you think uh, Solomon is promoting a prosperity gospel here? Well, yeah, you, if you read it, you know, just reading it, you might think so. Uh, now I think what he's saying here is it's part of becoming wise, understanding that uh, we can count on God providing for us when we honor Him. When we take to heart, really giving God the first and the greatest, then I think. He will honor us by us being able to do it again if we do it with these kinds of attitudes. It's not a prosperity gospel that says, oh, we're going to get a new car or we're going to win the lottery or whatever else. It may not be much, <laughs> you know, but he honors what we give and he blesses what we give. Uh, it's sort of Philippians 4.19. And this same God who sacrificed that is acceptable to God and pleased him. Oh, wait a minute. That's, I missed it here. You said 19? Uh, Philippians 4.19. 4, 19. 4, 19. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. And, you know, that's right. And this same God who takes care of you, will supply all of your needs for his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Okay, what does it say? God will provide all. Again, that word all. If we give all, he provides all. He will meet all of our needs, whether it may be Physical, spiritual, I don't know. 
It says all, so I have to say it's everything. And he'll provide all our needs. Uh, and that's what we need to look at. Proverbs 3, 11. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke. Yeah, let's go ahead and do 12 too because we got to speed up here. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son who delights him. Okay. Do not despise the Lord's discipline. Uh, can God's discipline be hard at times? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, for me, sometimes any discipline. Uh, how about the discipline of exercise? Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> yeah. How about the discipline of eating right? <laughs> Uh, oh, kale or hamburger? Uh, how about the discipline of spending money you don't have? Or maybe, maybe even splurging on something with the attitude of, I deserve that. Why do you do? Uh, what is an undisciplined life? What does he say? It is uh, because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights. As a father, the son he delights in. Uh, Ephesians 4.14 yeah, We will no longer be like children forever changing our minds about what we believe because someone has told us something different or because someone has cleverly lied to us and made the lie sound like the truth. Okay, so if you have an undisciplined life, life you're going to be childlike. And when you're childlike, <clears throat> what does Paul say? You'll fall for anything. Yeah, you'll fall for anything. You'll be tossed about. You won't know up from down, right from wrong, or whatever. You, you will be a, as Holman would say, a fool. Because you're not listening to God, you're listening to whoever is out there. A YouTube influencer or, uh, you know, some personality, uh, some actor or actress or whatever else or someone else who they don't have any more clue than you do but they sound good uh, but it leads to no good my sister put it this way one time she says some people make a lot more sense speaking the words of others uh, yeah <laughs> I still like you can't fix it what Paul was trying to say here, there needs to be unity in the faith. We need to become mature as Christians. And that's what I think all these Proverbs are about. Solomon is trying to help the reader have that relationship to where they can develop that wisdom to become mature, responsible, and disciplined individuals. And they can do great things for God. Sort of it in a nutshell, isn't it? Because, on the other hand, you're just going to be a little child floating around in the stormy seas, you know, crying for help. Nobody's going to help you, and you're going to go this way, that way, and eventually drown, probably. Okay, any other questions? It's been a long time. I, don't, I always thought Proverbs would go quickly, and I thought, man, I'd be lucky to get 30 minutes out of some of these lessons. And, oh, Lord. Any questions, comments? Wisdom for the week? Good lesson, Gary. Good lesson. Thanks. Uh, it's God's, God's lesson, not mine. Uh, and let me tell you, you know, I read this and so it convicts me a little bit. Was it Nebuchadnezzar that said he was going to build bigger and better farms than his life was taken? No, that was the rich man. Yeah, we don't know if it's Nebuchadnezzar or anybody else, but uh, it was the rich man said, 
you know, he had the great crops and everything else, and he said, you know, I'm going to, it was a parable from Jesus, uh, and he said, I'm going to build bigger barns, eat, drink, and be merry. And the God looked down and said, you, you fool, tonight your life will be full. In fact, this is a facade. You can end the lesson here. Uh, just as a facade, uh, Jesus speaks a lot about the rich, doesn't he? And he talks about the rich young ruler, uh, the, the rich man who built the barns, uh, Lazarus, the rich man. And I have had some preachers over the years preach a sermon that sort of combined all of those, taking it from the rich young ruler all the way to uh, him dying in the Lazarus or the building of the barns and say, it's the same guy. Because he didn't follow God, here's how his life ended up. And, you know, I think about it, I think, well, it could have been the same guy. Because he said, I have great responsibility, I have great wealth, and people need me, and what happens? He lives out his life, and, you know, he has a big banquet, uh, and ends up in hell. And so, uh, I don't know, it's one thought. It makes for an interesting sermon, <laughs> so uh, you can treat that for what it's worth. But, yeah, you can look up a lot of scriptures on uh, the rich man, and uh, yeah, sort of put it all together. Anything else? Okay, I'm going to put my mask back on and let me pray you out here. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for these wise words, words that should, uh, as we think about them, as we study them, should have all of us examine where we are in our relationship with you and maybe uh, correct ourselves and become more disciplined in some of the things that we do. Uh, just guide us this week. Uh, keep us safe. Keep us well. And we pray that we'll be back worshiping you next, next week. Let's pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.